Hey, Dan, it's great to be here with you today. Thanks so much for joining me. How's it going? Uh, I'm doing great, Lindsay. Thank you very much. Your school year is rapidly approaching an end. I bet you might be ready. Oh, we're counting the days. <laughs> <laughs> Just some exciting last few weeks, I'm sure. So it's uh, thanks so much for joining us. Another author interview today to support the learning that we can share with our viewers and our community out there around the book that is just about to come out on international education leadership stories from around the globe. We're so excited that you were able to participate, share your background, your experience, and some ideas that viewers and readers can gain. Just would love to start off, have you share a little bit about your background in international education. Sure, Lindsay, and first of all, let me uh, thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, very exciting project. Um, well, I've spent most of my professional career uh, as an international educator. I've worked at uh, two schools, two international schools in Colombia. Uh, I've also worked um, as a teacher in the Toronto District School Board. And for the past uh, six years, I've been the head of school at Colegio uh, Panamericano in Bucaramanga, Colombia. Um, in July, I'll be making a transition. Um, I'll be leaving Colombia, which has been my home for uh, almost 20 years and moving with my family to uh, Costa Rica, where I'll be taking on the headship of uh, Del Mar Academy in Nosada, Costa Rica. Oh, that's super exciting. It's I'm sure it's bittersweet to leave a school in a country where you've been for so long, but the new adventures that these experiences present, no doubt, that's, that's really exciting too. So Absolutely. I loved reading your chapter and talking about professional learning and the ways that your school navigated this experience to support teachers' professional growth. I know you've done your doctoral research on this area as well, but particularly with that lens on the challenges that were presented by the pandemic. No doubt that some of those challenges may continue to present themselves, unfortunately. But for that reason, I think people will gain a lot of ideas in how they work around professional learning in their schools. Would you be able to share just a few really kind of key highlights and points that you would say are those nuggets, those gold nuggets that people could take away from the chapter that you shared in the book? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, you know, kind of the genesis of the chapter was really around uh, a, a leadership dilemma that we faced as we saw, you know, the limited time and energy that teachers had because of the COVID restrictions, uh, yet the need to really be continuing to advance in providing high quality professional development and uh, promoting teacher growth. Um, so some of the, 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 the key th topics, I, I guess, in that chapter is around really looking at readiness, um, teacher readiness, because we know that uh, before we engage in any type of change uh, or any type of initiative or any type of uh, professional development uh, project, we need to really look at the readiness of the organization and the capacity of the teachers to participate in that, in that change. Um, so assessing readiness, and then once you've assessed the readiness, how can you address it to really go forward uh, with, with, with the change or with, with the, uh, the project? Um, in our context, the change that we were looking for was um, really promoting a project-based learning. And that came with it. That's a, a complex um, and challenging type of pedagogy. So we knew we needed to accompany it with, uh, with um, a, a robust professional development. Um, so uh, we wanted to make sure that we were considering teacher agency because one of the things that we found happened uh, to all of us is that the pandemic stripped away our senses of agency and we we couldn't go to the gym we couldn't see our friends we couldn't uh for weeks at a time go even out of the house and so we kind of lost that influence over our own lives and so as we can come back to school face to face and and in a post-pandemic type of school, uh, we want to make sure that we are providing that, that sense of teacher agency. So we are um, uh, making sure that teachers feel that they have um, influence over uh, the decisions that affect them, uh, their professional learning, and the pedagogy that they implement in their classroom. And so, um, there was a few uh, different ways that, that we did that. Um, 
One way is to share, distribute the leadership, um, really allow teachers uh, to be a part of the planning. Um, and, and, and doing that really could increase the teacher agency um, in the school. Uh, because we knew that the uh, readiness and the time was limited um, and the, the teacher emotional uh, capacity was limited, we really needed to focus in on some key elements of the learning and key elements of the professional development. And so we very carefully selected um, one area of professional development, and we were inspired by a book by Charles Duhigg called The Power of Habits, um, and he talks about keystone habits. And the example he uses is that if you focus in on one habit, and he uses the example of uh, putting your, your gym bag beside the door uh, in the morning, and he says that if you can do that, then you're more likely to go to the gym, and that generates a cycle of good habits because people who, when you go to the gym, you tend to uh, eat better, take care of yourself, get more sleep. And so it starts a virtuous cycle of, 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 of habits. And so we kind of took that approach to our professional development and we knew that there was a, a, a certain um, project planning protocol that if we could put in place and make that a habit at our school, uh, many of the other good habits around uh, project-based learning would fall into place. And so that was our key habit that we tried to uh, really focus on. And then, and then finally, you know, another key uh, point of the chapter is how we tried to move away from a, a workshop-based model of professional development because we know that too often uh, schools use uh, institutes or conferences or, or workshops to, 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 to introduce teachers to new strategies, but then they kind of leave it at that. And if there's not the support for teachers to experiment, to try the new strategy, and then reflect on the effectiveness on the strategy, um, we're missing a really major, point, uh, major element of, of professional learning, and then you're not going to see the growth. Um, so those are the, the, the main topics, the main areas of, of my chapter. I think there's so much rich content out there for leaders of all levels to learn from, to be honest, because I feel like professional learning is an area that whether it gets enough attention or not in a school's leadership realm necessarily, it's crucial and vital to the success of the school and the learning that's happening there. So I think it's an interesting topic. I'm going to ask you to elaborate on one additional piece of it. We know international education often sees a lot of teacher transiency. What were some things that you guys found successful at your school? to address or to kind of mitigate, I guess, the effects of that turnover you might experience in your staff when you were trying to put all this into place? Yeah, well, I think that when you talk about teacher turnover, I think, you know, we look at what's, you know, the typical teacher turnover. And I think the research that I've found in uh, South America has been around 28% uh, of uh, expat staff turnover each year. And that uh, has, at least in our setting, increased during uh, the pandemic, those years when we were in pandemic, uh, to 38%. And quite frankly, it, it has still remained uh, high. So uh, we are facing a situation where we have new staff coming into our school that maybe has not had the benefit of the last couple of years of professional development on project-based learning. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're being extremely um, uh, deliberate about uh, providing that training for teachers and that professional development as they come into school. Um, one way to do that is really um, uh, uh, leveraging the experience of some of the experience of the uh, more expert teachers uh, in uh, uh, project-based learning to mentor some of the the new staff, and in that way, you're really um, tailoring the learning that needs to happen specifically to the new teacher. Um, so that they can address really those those uh, pedagogical skills that that teacher needs to be successful in a project-based learning uh, uh, environment. Awesome. Great ideas. All right, so we asked you to write a chapter for the book, but no doubt in your career, there's probably lots of topics and things you could have chosen to write about. Was there something that you thought of also in addition to professional learning that would have been an alternative topic that you think would be valuable for readers 
to have learned from. Yeah, absolutely, Lindsay. The, you know, I think in international education, we really, you know, try as schools to promote diversity, uh, equity, global uh, citizenship in our students. And often we don't turn that lens back on ourselves uh, and some of the practices that are going on. And I'm talking about professional development. I think too often uh, we adhere to a very US-based, expert-driven source of professional development. Um, and what happens there is we're just kind of promoting some of the, you know, post-colonial patterns that, that um, where U.S.-based education is considered superior to uh, the rest of the world. And so um, some of the things that um, I've really tried to look at at my school is what are the sources of professional development, you know, and if it has to be U.S.-based, how are we really um, empowering our teachers to take that knowledge and bring their own beliefs and their own culture and their own backgrounds and, and to mediate that learning to promote the professional growth that is very much contextualized um, for, our school, for, our, for our schools, for our students and for our teachers. Mm -hmm. And another area that um, I was piqued my interest in and perhaps uh, would have liked to write about is, you know, some of the barriers that um, are presented to some of our staff who are local, in my context, Colombian staff who, who may not have the travel documents to go to the United States or maybe not have the length, the, uh, uh, language ability in English to access the same professional development. So I think there's a lot of um, equity issues in the way that international schools provide professional development. And I think if we want to be a school that is uh, that promotes diversity, equity, and uh, global citizenship that we want to see in our students, we need to turn that lens back on ourselves and ensure that all of our practices are that way. Yep. I think that in itself is worthy of a new chapter, first of all, but also just a, a really valuable idea for our listeners to consider and, and chew on as they look back at their own schools. and and consider the equity opportunities in professional learning explicitly. So I was part of a wonderful school community where we were able to travel internationally from our own country in the Dominican Republic to conferences. And we had local staff join us on the trip and several of them didn't have passports and had never left their own country, but it was mm -hmm. an amazing experience. However, some of the actual professional learning experiences they were in were still very North American oriented. So that's an interesting kind of piece to reflect back on also too, to think the layers there. I love it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to shift a little more in the direction of your life in the international community as an educator for this, your career here. There's always no shortage of stories. There's adventures, you know, they're funny ones, the scary ones, the embarrassing ones, all of the above. But if you travel home, or if you travel to visit friends in other countries, and you know this is a great story of something wild that happened to you in your life abroad, what would be one of those stories? Well, Lindsay, I, I, I'd have to say that I have, you know, one story that I think was humorous but also humbling at the same time was my very first day in Colombia. Uh, I had never been to Colombia. I had. I did not speak Spanish. Um, this was really, and I hate to date myself, but this was kind of, this was before, before YouTube and before the internet and before travel blogs or I whatever. Get that. So, so I was really just, what I knew was really from a guidebook or maybe an atlas. And so I arrived in Colombia and I, I remember uh, landing uh, at the airport in Manizales, Colombia and uh, it was a, a, a small plane, and and I was one of the last to disembark. And as I was stepping down the steps, I saw that they had out on the tarmac a bunch of people uh, with balloons and signs, and there was like a band playing. Uh, and, and I said, 
my goodness, you know, I had heard that everyone said that Colombians were so friendly uh, people and, and welcoming people. I'm like, what a wonderful welcome. And so as I'm walking towards uh, this group of people, I, I, I'm waiting for them to embrace me, uh, but they, 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 they didn't really notice me. And I, so I just kind of kept walking and, and, and walked past them and followed the other passengers. And I turned around and, and behind me was a, a very famous Colombian politician. It, it was the presidential election campaign and, and, and he was visiting the city. So it was a welcome for a presidential a candidate. Um, so even though that and welcome wasn't for me, uh, you know, I, everywhere I've gone in my 20 years in Colombia, um, I've met friendly people, happy people, welcoming people. And that's yeah. been the reason why I've, I've stayed uh, for so long in Colombia. And my wife's Colombian, so uh, uh, she's yeah. the, uh, another very important reason why I've stayed. <laughs> well, I'm going to say that was a symbolic welcome, right? <laughs> I'll take it. That's a good memory. A good memory. Yes. Sure. So, all right. So you've probably done quite a bit of travel too, whether internally in Colombia or elsewhere too. So we're going to ask you to give up a secret. What would be that one spot that you always dream of returning? And what was it that made it that spot? Oh my goodness. I mean, I've been so fortunate to live in Colombia and uh, it's, it's a wonderfully diverse country with uh you know the people the culture the foods the music uh, and the geography and so narrowing it down to one is is quite frankly an impossible task Lindsay. so I, I, i'll i'll say you know the two things i love sitting having a cup of coffee in the coffee region of colombia looking out in the morning yeah. and seeing that mist just climb up climb up the mountain um that's a very, very special uh, part of Colombia. And it's the, uh, the Eje Cafetero uh, will always be in my heart. Beautiful. Oh, I would like to be there right now, actually. But I think you're going to find that you get some wonderful coffee experiences in Costa Rica also. So, yes. We're yeah. looking forward to Costa Rica. Uh, the family's looking forward to moving to Costa Rica. And, you know, it's got mountains, it's got beaches, it's got coffee and very friendly people. So I think the transition from Colombia to Costa Rica uh, should be a smooth one. Yep, I would agree. Well, Dan, thank you so much for sharing all of those stories and a little bit more context of your book chapter. And we hope our readers enjoy learning from it as much as I did. We're grateful for you to join us today and Look forward to sharing all of this with our community. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Thanks for watching and learning with us at School Rubric with educators from across the globe. For more access to articles, magazines, podcasts, live episodes, our international school directory, courses, and more, visit us at schoolrubric.org. Thank you.